And then one day I was uh, sitting in my home uh, drinking a glass of uh, fine liquor and looking at the website and seeing the book a demo button. And I was thinking to myself, I would never <laughs> click this button. I would never book a demo to my own company. Why would I do this? I would never buy something like that. And then I knew something had to be done. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by Jay Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley, in partnership with Lomitech, and sponsored by Homeward Ventures, Hippo Insurance, Opwest, Hillel at Stanford, Leap, and Birthright Excel. Welcome to another episode of 20 Minute Leaders. I'm honored to be joined by Shimon Tolz, the CEO and co-founder of The Tree IO. Shimon established and managed the software engineering infrastructure department for 400 engineers at IronSource. Also, as an AWS community hero, Shimon runs the largest AWS user group worldwide and is an avid speaker at conferences. Today, Shimon is the CEO and co-founder at Datri, an automated policy enforcement solution for Kubernetes. The CLI tool prevents Kubernetes misconfigurations by ensuring the manifests and helm charts follow best practices as well as your organization's policies. Shimon Tots, welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Hey, thank you so much for having me. This is the second time that, I, that I'm having you. The first time was on Zoom during COVID. Uh, and now I get to be in your beautiful offices, uh, which unfortunately you can't see too much of with these walls, but, but, it's, but behind there, there's a group of amazing engineers and amazing people that are working on building this really awesome product. And while last time we talked about infrastructure, it, it, code is infrastructure, and we talked about the world of DevOps, there's going to be a really interesting story to hear this time because you've had a lot of different things happening over this last year since we had our last episode. And I can't wait to learn more about Shimon and a lot more about the conviction that you came in with that I think I as a young entrepreneur and many young entrepreneurs can learn so much from. So Shimon, in a few words about the tree and then take us a little bit through your COVID journey that you had. Wow. So it's really fun to be here. Thank you very much. And we're really honored to have you here with us. It's much better than last time <laughs> using Zoom. Um, in a few words, what we do is we prevent misconfigurations from ever reaching production in a Kubernetes a based environments. So basically you have developers that are writing code, making changes, working on different Kubernetes manifests, Helm templates, and then they're shipping them into production. And many times you can make mistakes. You can forget to put in a memory limit, a liveness probe and so on. And then this can affect your production. So what we do is we apply automated tests that run every time that there is a code change made by a developer. And if he or she makes a mistake and forgets some policy, we prevent this change from reaching production and causing great issues. Now, this is not something that necessarily would have been relevant six or seven years ago. And so what, what happened in the world of computing and cloud that, that enables this problem to be so significant today uh, that wasn't before? Yeah, so I think that the main changes that happen is our shift into developer autonomy you know, breaking up the, the teams and making it possible for anyone to deploy into production. And before those days, we used to have the ops teams, they would take everything into production and we had the development teams who would just write the code and maybe QA teams that would test it. Now in the DevOps world, it's all mashed together. And together with that, the cloud and the cloud native technologies like uh, that came from the Cloud Native Foundation, like Kubernetes, uh, which is actually, I call it an abstraction layer um, on top of all infrastructure. It can be Amazon, Google, Azure, no matter what, you can use Kubernetes in order to actually operate your data center. And this is a common language, common API that everyone uses now in the world in order to do so. Um, because the world started shifting into a very fragmented place where you would have the Amazon APIs and the Google APIs and Azure APIs and so on. So now everything is being brought back together using the Cloud Native Foundation. Amazing. And so you're, you're working in that domain and you're, you're understanding that the autonomy of developers is introducing different problems to the world that didn't exist six or seven years ago. So with all the goodness <clears throat> that we have from the autonomy, now there's different uh, 
different prone to errorness and and this is where the trick comes in and it's really relevant to any any uh, company that is living in the cloud or is moving to the cloud which is everybody and so take me back a year or a little bit more than a year you're in white combinator last time I was here you were doing something a little bit different a little bit more general tell me a little bit about the journey that you took on yourself to understand really what you want to be doing okay so a lot of happened as you know in the covid world is a uh obviously uh, changed a lot. J- just to refresh your mind, you know, before I started the tree, I was a uh, uh, head of an engineering department at Iron Source, and which is a great company. They're now IPOing for ten billion dollars. Um, so despite you being head of the scene. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what happened there is I was leading the infrastructure division, and we had four hundred engineers. And one day an engineer made a mistake. We all make mistakes, I make mistakes, you make mistakes. And we post-mortem it and we found the problem. But then we had no way of propagating these development standards to the entire company. We started sending emails and trying to do you know, conferences, but it, it wasn't scalable. And this is what actually prompted me and my co-founder Yar to quit our jobs and to do it in an automated way that is seamlessly integrated within the development workflow. So every time a developer makes a code change, like when you write a Word document, you have the small uh, spell checker that tells you, hey, there's a problem. Imagine the same thing only in, in our world with code and Kubernetes. And th- the interesting part is that when we started, we started the company as a top-down organization, sales-led, And now, after the COVID year, we've actually made a, a huge change, and we're now a product-led growth company, and we focus on bottoms up. And there is no more schedule a demo. There is only get started, and you get to experience and evaluate the product by yourself. But you're skipping the whole fun part here. I want to know the Shimon journey, because you're sitting there, and you shared with me before we started that it was almost a moment, a eureka moment as an entrepreneur that I think is... So lacking from what we hear today about entrepreneurial stories, this overnight success which doesn't exist. But, well, now you mentioned that within a month you already have you know, over a dozen companies subscribed to this new product. Well, it's not an overnight success because you've had a year and a half of a journey to get there. I want to know about that journey. So it was very, very strange to me because when I, back in the day when I was an engineering manager, I would never click on book a demo. I'd rather jump off a cliff than uh, click on book a demo. Why am I crazy? Like, In engineering, you go, you test the things out. If it works, you put the credit card. And if you need to talk to sales, you talk to them. But it works the other way around. And when we started the company, this was the intuitive thing for me to do. But it was in 2017. Everywhere I looked around, every VC I talked to, most of the entrepreneurs, and by the way, Israel is very much uh, influenced by the top-down security system. oriented companies, right. which the default playbook is the security enterprise sales, selling to the CISO. So everyone I talked to, it was like, okay, how many companies did you meet? How many dinners did you have? How many POCs did you start? And it was, was all, you know, everyone was talking in top-down um, terms. And I was like, am I the only crazy one here? <laughs> Like, and I was like, I must be crazy because everyone that I was talking to is just, okay, get, get SDRs, call to people, email people, go to dinners and so on. And we've always wanted to do a self-serve platform, a true PLG, but, but we've always said like, eh, in, the, in the future, in the future, in the future. And then what happened is as COVID started, we already had more than 15, 15 companies as customers paying hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's the biggest organizations in the world. Yes. And, uh, and at this point, we couldn't meet them anymore. Everything became Zoom, and you couldn't go to conferences. You know, j- just before that, in reInvent, we had 90 demos in four days. It was crazy. It was really I wrote a blog post about it. We can link to it. It was totally crazy. And then in one second, everything turned. And, and I found myself thinking, how are we supposed to continue driving the business if we can't meet customers, if we can't present it at, at you know, shows, because this was our main MO. And then one day I was uh, sitting at my home uh, drinking a glass of uh, fine liquor, 
and looking at the website and seeing the book a demo button, and I was thinking to myself, I would never <laughs> click this button. I would never book a demo to my own company. Why would I do this? I would never buy something like that. And then I knew something had to be done. And me and Ayer, we talked about it, and we discovered this wonderful thing called product-led growth. Now, and I was reading through it, and I was like, oh my God, this is how I was always buying software. This is how I want to sell software. This is actually how I want to go and solve the problem that I felt in the way that I would want to buy the, the solution. And this prompted us to make a huge change, close the US office, go back to Israel, make a lot of changes, and work on reducing friction and launching as product-led growth. And now you're saying this whole, you know, you, in three sentences, you're skipping over, you know, weeks and months of, of labor. And I'm, and I'm guessing as an entrepreneur, it's not that easy to just close the US branch for an Israeli startup to open the US branch, it's a big milestone. Also for the VCs, it's a big, it's a big vote of confidence that we're progressing forward. And you almost have to counterintuitively, you know, put your ego aside and say, no, 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 we, we need to go a few steps back so that we can run much faster forward. You're absolutely right. And you know, I, I lived in Tel Aviv for 10 years as a Tel Avivian, and I really love Tel Aviv. And I did not want to move to San Francisco, but I was like, okay, this is the company, this is the move, this is the classical top-down, the CEO relocates to the valley, opens up a sales office, SDRs and so on, and this is what we did. And then as I got there and we actually opened the office and hired people and so on and COVID hit, actually we we're fortunate that we have great, great investors like Rona Segev and Yotfat Arel Buchris and Yuval Cohen and many, many others and angels. And they all immediately told me, Shimon, just come back. We want you to be safe. This is what's important. And I'm like, no, I'm on a mission here. I moved here because we need to do this. This is what we're going to do. And I was very stubborn. And then I found myself months after months after months sitting in my apartment talking like this and like doing Zoom calls and like not meeting anyone, not talking at any conferences. And then after some time, I was like, okay, I'm going to fly back to Israel because there's nothing for me to do here. And we fired our wonderful salesperson who now works at another company and he's amazing. And we changed our marketing to someone who has more experience in this bottom up sales, uh, bottom up motion. And we're really, really fortunate that our investment team and leadership team was really supportive of us. And I, I met many people who looked at me and told me, you did what? Are you crazy? And we, we just couldn't not, not do it. This was like, we, we felt it that this is the right way for us to do it. In most companies, they do growth motions and then they add sales on it. So we have already proven that people want to pay money for it. They need it. There is a need. And now we're working on the adoption effort. And a month ago, we launched an open source Go, uh, Go project that you can actually run on your laptop and put in your CI CD. And every time that a developer makes a change in Helm or Kubernetes configuration, that the tree CLI runs and scans for misconfigurations. And those misconfigurations are central, uh, are managed in a centralized way through the, the tree dashboard. And then you can also mix and match and adjust the policy according to your organizational standards. And it's, it's really wonderful because, you know, after one month that we've launched, we have dozens of companies. And I'm just thinking, you know, in a, in a top-down world, getting dozens of companies, it's like sending 500 emails and cold calling. And, and here you get people from the internet. They just come in and, and you work really on, on crystallizing the journey and understanding the pain point. And we had to remove a lot of features from our product in order to make it really, really clear as to what is the value that they are getting. And at this point, you see people that come in, go to the marketing website, go to the docs, install it in their computer, play with it, put it in their production, apply it to their CI CD processes, and, and it's amazing. And then we, we talk to them and we're like, hey, we'd love to talk to you. And they send scrolls of feedback. Wow. This is great. This is good. This is awful. Please fix this. Those are the problems. Like, amazing. Now we have real user feedback that we can use in order to improve our product. Right. 
So you, you can literally wake up in the morning and all of a sudden you see you have two new companies that have, that have you're onboarded. Today, this is what happened today. Amazing. So tell me a little bit more about product-led growth. So as the CEO now, you're, you're leading this ship and how are you thinking about this product you know, as a sort of derivative of, of, what, of the responses from the market and from, the, from developers outside? How, how, do, how does your mind wrap around around this? So I think that um, the key aspects of looking at the PLG is understanding the shift from the era where we used to sell software to the CIO or the CISO. Then the next shift after it was selling the software to the executives. And now here comes the end user era, era, which is the PLG era. You're used to using Instagram. You're uh, quite an influencer there. And uh, all, all the different apps. And you're used to uh, a certain experience. And then you come and you use classical enterprise software. And you go like, oh my God, what is this? Awful, bad UI, bad UX, doesn't work well. And, and all of you're like, what is this? And, and the shift in PLG is that you cater the product to the end user, not to the buyer, not to the executive, not to the company, to the user. Great examples of it, Slack. Great examples of it, uh, Twilio. You, you want to send SMS, you go and it is catered for the engineer to actually send the messages. And when you think about Working as PLG and, and as a company that made the transition from a, a sales-driven organization to PLG, you need to change the way of thinking from there's a customer and they want feature ABC in order to close the deal. It's the other way around. We see X amount of companies. We think that we can do this feature according to this their feedback and this will reduce the friction. And you have to constantly reduce the friction and be data driven. I was just about to say, it sounds like this approach is much more of a data driven approach. It's much less subjective to your sales ability or to the vibe that, that the other person got because you're then you're here, you're selling a value. And if you're good, you're going to sell it because they're coming to you. And the other way around, there's a lot of different factors that may go into them buying it. And you never really know whether it's whether you're actually providing real value, right? Absolutely. You know, when, when you're in a top-down organization, and by the way, I'm not saying that everyone should just do PLG and there are no companies that need to do sales approach. I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, if it suits your, your product and, and you need to, and the product has to, to cater to a very fast self ability to evaluate the product and if it brings value to you, it has to show you the aha moment really, really fast and for you to understand it. And if this, this fits your, your, um, your product's category, th then you can do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, one of the most important things is to measure. Because as you said, it's not like in top-down organization where, ah, oh, we had three dinners, I guess it's 50%. <laughs> but here we actually know how many people come to the website, how many people come to the docs, how many people install it, how many people use it, how many invocations they do every day, every week, every month. And then we sit as a leadership team and we look at it and go like, okay, where do we think we should optimize now? This area, this area, this area, and what do we think has to be done in order to perform those optimizations? And by the way, I got to say, from my, my experience, for example, our engineering team, all of a sudden, they're really involved in the business because they see the numbers, they see the data, they see the influence of releasing new features, fixing bugs, and seeing the numbers go up and understanding exactly their impact. I can imagine the, you know, the front-end engineer coming and saying that there's this drop in conversion between page two and three. And I can, I can see them you know, staying up at night thinking, why, why is this happening? Maybe if I shift this around or if I play this experiment, it's going to shift. And, and, and I just love this approach completely. And it's, you know, it's almost like mixing together a, a B2C in a B2B world. And, and it's such a big mishmash. I think, it, I think it's amazing. Shimon, we can go on for hours talking about uh, product-led growth but I have a few questions for Shimon and 20 minutes is not enough time nearly. And I want to take you back to your childhood. What fascinated you truly? And it can't be Kubernetes. I already did this joke before and he cracked up. So he cracked up completely. <laughs> what fascinated you as a kid, really? 
I think that what fascinated me as a kid, and it still fascinated, fascinates me today, is understanding how things work. And this, I remember like when I was in fourth grade, I saw my first computer that my parents brought. And I, I remember seeing it and I was supposed to be asleep. And then when they went to sleep, I woke up and I, and I, I, and I looked at it and I started clicking all the buttons and opening it up and looking what, what's actually inside. What is this thing? Literally opening it literally. up. Literally. Yeah, 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 literally. Not, not turning it on, opening it up. Yeah, it's like, what is here? What Most is... people don't do that. So it's important distinction. <laughs> For me, it, it was natural, you know? And, and this fascinates me how to understand how things work. And, and, and it's, I guess it's curiosity in a way because I'm very, very curious. And, and this leads you to also understanding how things work and then applying it in order to achieve greater goals for yourself. So Amazing. Along your journey, some role model, in, um, a figure of inspiration for you, either profess professionally or personally. So you know what? I think that what I take with me almost every day I would actually say the founders of Iron Source. Really? And there are nine of them, which is a lot. <laughs> and everyone has their own flavor. But to me, I would really, really would like to have a culture that is similar to it. They have radical trust. They really, really trust in you. The first day they give you the keys, you also get the responsibility, but you get all the credit and to do amazing things. For me, Iron Source was the land of opportunity from a developer to a team leader, to an R&D manager, to a general manager of, an in, of a division, and really to grow up. And, and for me, I always try to enable every person in the company and to never say no in a way like, you wanna try something, you wanna do it, you wanna achieve it, you should do it. And this is the, the spirit that I got from it. And they really inspired me when opening this company. Amazing, amazing. And what are three words or two or four that you would choose to describe yourself? So I think I'm very, very curious. I think that I'm uh, very ambitious at, at achieving the things that I really strive to get, which by the way can also make you a bit tunnel vision, which is not always uh, so good. Um, and I really, really believe in karma. I don't know if it fits in the, but uh, really, I really believe in, you know, meeting with young entrepreneurs and helping them like, like people helped me and, and always, you know, gr meeting great people and trying to, to help without any, you know, at the end of the day, things will turn out good. And I really, really believe in good energy and karma. Shimon, תודה רבה. תודה רבה.